you know, well, welcome to my place. You know it. Yeah, it's a boarding house. Welcome to my house. I keep calling it a house, and it's not. It's an apartment, but I keep calling it like... We'll call it. We'll call it a house. Yeah. I don't know. It's a millennial house, because <laughs> we don't buy houses. There you go. All right. Welcome back to the Christ and Culture. This is Clint. And this is Gordon. I actually have a topic to talk about here real quick. I'm like li- right I'm li- now? I'm a little nervous about something, to be honest. And you're doing this thing too, but oh, yeah. you're yeah, much yeah. much more cautious than I am. So I'm much not, more cautious? Not cautious. That's not the right the word. The opposite of cautious? much more relaxed, oh. I think. So we, by the time this comes out, we, we would have started already, but we're doing Exodus 90 right now. Yeah. And... To be honest, the the fasting, the the praying, the fraternity, all that stuff sounds great. The thing that's bothering me the most is no podcasts, no TV, no movies, and it's going to drive me nuts. I always have so much like media and stuff to take in. Going off of that, though, that means we're going to need more recommendations for <laughs> from you guys for what you want, because basically the way it's going to work, at least for my part, is I have gotten the exception where I can break the fast for the show, but it has to be very intentional. Mm-hmm. So I can only like go watch like one thing to prep an episode. Right. So if you guys want something, you have to tell me what you want us to research so I can go do that. Otherwise there will be no media intake for the next 90 days. Which probably means we need to change that initial segment of our podcast or just remove it all together. But oh, what media you're current intaking. media? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it might be pretty absent for the next couple of months. I remember, so I've done this before, and I'm not doing it as strong, I don't know the, the word. Strict. Strictly. Yeah. Just because this, this starts on the first day of my honeymoon. Yeah. And so I'm like, nah, I'm not starting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go celebrate. <laughs> oh, yes, I can't do fast. most of this. <laughs> but I remember when I did it before, yeah, TV was hard just because it's on everywhere. Yeah. Even when you go eat, you know, and it's not like, it's not like something you consciously, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm I just, just staring at that screen. Right. Yeah. And my rule of thumb with this, and maybe I'm wrong for thinking this, but maybe if you guys have done Exodus 90, let us know what you think. I'm not too worried about that kind of stuff because that's something that's outside of our control, mm-hmm. you know? So like if someone else is watching it, I'm not going to go watch it with them. Right. I mean, unless, what's the rule? Like, unless something causes scandal, right? Where... If it's causing an issue, like if you're married to someone and you're avoiding them because they're watching TV and you're not spending time together, I mean, that's one thing, but I'm not married to anyone, so I don't have an excuse to really worry about that. So I'm just going to, if something comes up and I'm at a restaurant or something, let it happen. Mm -hmm. That's that's about it. It'll be good. I'm excited. Yeah. So speaking of current media, since you mentioned this might be one of the last times we actually get to do that well for a (laughs) while. What have you been taking in? Not a whole lot. <laughs> um, nothing TV or movie-wise, really. Mm-hmm. I finished I finished movies that I've previously mentioned on the show. So I finished The Irishman. Okay. That was a long time coming. I also finished, I don't know if it's A Marriage Story or The Marriage Story or just Marriage Story. I, I think, think it's just Marriage, marriage story. story. But I finished that as well. Um, I haven't really been listening to podcasts as much just because i am only been really like up to speed with like catching foxes and between then like I usually listen to Art of Manly so I'm kind of bored with it right now and all the other ones are kind of on the same pace like with Catholic stuff you should know and then the mysterious world all really interesting stuff but like the way they do the podcast like the way it sounds and the conversation is like the same and I'm looking for something different so I started listening to D&D podcast again mm. Mostly welcome, greetings, adventures. And that's about it. I just moved into my new place. So the past really day, I've been like setting stuff up while listening to like vinyls and then playing video games because I don't have internet. Are you taking in anything else, Gordon? I don't think so. Not that I can. That's fair though. You have wedding prep. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. I'll take it. Yeah. I'll accept it. Yeah. I got quite a bit of stuff. Mostly things that um 
I took in over Christmas. I'm going to save some of them for future episodes so I can still do this segment of the show in the future. But um, yeah, since we have Exodus 90 coming up, I have been trying to binge a lot of episodes so that I'm not super behind in three months. So I've been listening a lot to Catholic Answers Live and all their affiliate podcasts, including Jamie Aiken's Mysterious World, which is one you just mentioned. One of my favorites right now, if not the favorite. I watched the entire Netflix series The Witcher, which was interesting. <laughs> heard mixed reviews. Yeah. Not even really mixed. I've heard it's not great, but like the action scenes are really phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, I I never played the game, so maybe I don't appreciate it. I think it's a book series, too. It's a book series book and series a video first. game. I didn't do either of that. I just heard it was something that was very fantasy and had a big budget. So I was like, all right, we'll check it out. Very Game of Thronesy in yeah. the sexuality, okay. unnecessary stuff like that. Somewhat interesting storyline, but it's hard to follow because it's, it's chopped up. So you really don't know the time frame. And actually, I didn't even know it was takes place over like 80 years i didn't realize that until i was about four episodes in out of an eight episode season i was like oh yeah this is all just in the same timeline nope every scene is like decades apart you didn't know that while watching it no here's why so it bounces between three main characters two of them don't die and they don't age so they look exactly the same decades later but because like of their speed of their race because they're magic. So one's a, a sorceress and Got one it. is the witcher. Okay. Yeah. And so they, they don't age, so you can't tell they're in a different How old is frame. the witcher then when it starts? You don't know. Okay. Of course. I mean, maybe people who like actually know the lore probably know, yeah. but yeah. I have no clue. Huh. Okay. Yeah. I really have any desire for it. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like, it's my kind of thing that I enjoy. Yeah. No. I'd... It's just unfortunate that it's always super sexualized. Yeah. Thank God for Lord of the Rings, right? <laughs> Hopefully, the TV show works out. But yeah, so I watched I watched The Witcher. It was interesting. And then, so, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Like I said, when I was on the plane, listened to that a bunch. And one of the episodes I listened to on the flight back to Iowa to visit my family was on the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. No way. And what actually happened to him. And I had literally no clue what this guy, who he was or anything you listen to this first yeah so i listened to this on the way back and i was like oh my gosh this is really interesting at the end of the episode they're like it's it's an old episode and they said something along the lines of yeah there's supposed to be a movie coming out with a lot of big name actors and they like looked it up on on the show and they're like we think it's going to be called the irishman but that's kind of a tentative title turns out like that's a huge movie right now and you said you just watched it my brother (laughs) had asked me to watch it too and so i'm like oh my gosh all right, I'll watch it. So I did three and a half hours long. That's the reason why I didn't want to watch it in the first place. It's just really long. And unless it's Lord of the Rings, you don't get three and a half hours from me. Sorry. But I did. It was actually really good. It is great. It was, it differed a little bit from what I had heard on the podcast, but mostly just in the way that they present the story, like him as an older man, if that makes sense. He's a little bit more eager to share in the end because gotcha. it's sharing but i'm really excited i want to read the book called i heard you paint houses which is what the movie was based off who of. wrote the book that's what i didn't know is it like it's not written by frank is it no it's a guy that interviewed him okay and it was something where this is why it was so interesting to me because frank everyone knew frank was involved apparently but because like you see in the movie no one comes forward because you can't right it's the mafia and so he didn't say anything until this one dude spent apparently like years and years visiting him in the nursing home and like built a relationship with him and over time frank finally started giving information and that's what this book was based off of okay and then eventually he just like let it all loose i mean i imagine it'll spoiler we'll get into this but i imagine another reason no one came forward was because of I mean, how powerful Frank ended up becoming as the Irishman, like with that ring and he was protected as well as like if anybody knew that came forward because he already had so much against him that would put him in prison. Like what's one more death on his on on his hands? Yeah. And I don't even know if they were afraid of Frank necessarily. He was more of just like he was the the guy who got his hands dirty. That's a big reason to be afraid of Frank. Right. But there's also the guys with the big power too 
Yeah, but this guy's with a big power just send Frank. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> Charles Brandt, that's the name of the guy. Huh. So without further ado, this is our topic for the week, The Irishman. It's a huge, huge movie. Most people have to sit down like four or five times to watch it. I think you had to take three or four. Three, I think three, yeah, three times. Yeah. So basically it is based off of one person's interpretation of a true story. So we'll kind of explain what that is. So Jimmy Hoffa, like I just said, he disappeared. And this is basically the story of one man who claimed to be involved in the whole thing. Actually, he's the man who claimed to murder Jimmy Hoffa. So his name is Frank Sheeran, played by Robert De Niro. Also, this is a huge rock star cast for mm-hmm. like for Mafia. You have Robert De Niro, you have Al Pacino, you have Joe Pesci, you have Ray Romano, which is kind of weird. But you have like, but it worked. It, it did. Yeah, it was yeah. good. And Joe Pesci came out of retirement just for this movie. Yeah. Oh, he was so good. <laughs> he was so I good. think he was the best in the whole movie, to be honest. I, I can agree. Uh, so good. But basically, what this is all about is we have this guy, Frank Sheeran, and it's basically him recounting what happened to the man that he claims to have killed, Jimmy Hoffa. Like we said at the beginning, no one in real life knows the full truth. No one was ever convicted of this. They never found the body, which is something else. So that's actually what the podcast I listened to was about. It's like, what happened to his body? And there's a lot of different theories. One of them that I thought was the most interesting was apparently the Giants football stadium was being built at the same time. And so there's a rumor that his body was buried in the end zone of the Giants football stadium. Apparently they dug it up, didn't find anything. So rumors are rumors. But there's a whole bunch of rumors of what happened to this guy. And maybe this kind of like shows how young and ignorant I am. But have you heard of Jimmy Hoffa before this? No, but... He's supposed to be huge. Well, that was the that was the joke he made, though, in the movie. Like, when he's talking to right. the nurse. Like, they make that point. Yeah. That, like, is a, it's a generational thing. When no one has any idea, but if you're old enough to recognize this, you know that he was apparently huge in politics and just in... In culture in general yeah. at the time. Yeah. Very, very loved man. And after his disappearance, we don't talk about him anymore because we don't know what's going on. So we'll go and dive into it. We have Frank Sheeran, played by Robert De Niro. We have Jimmy Hoffa, played by Al Pacino. We have Russell Buffalino, played by Joe Pesci. And then his cousin is Ray Romano, who's a lawyer. Uh, his name is Bill Buffalino. We have Angelo Bruno, who's a mob boss. We have Skinny Razor. That was one of the cool names. Uh, he's another mob boss that comes in. I think Bugs was my favorite name. Bugs. Yeah. That was a good one. We have Tony Pro, which comes in later on. That's his abbreviated name. But he he's running for election later on, but he's kind of like... The little guy. Yeah, he's the little guy, really short guy. He's a mobster, but a he's running guy. against Jimmy Hoffa. And that's really important, so keep that in mind. We also have... Father James Martin. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I didn't know. No. Yeah, Father James Martin is in there twice in the baptism scenes. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started with the story. We're going to try and keep it short, and your job is to make sure I don't talk too much on story. Yeah, I'll just sum it up right now. Great. Please do. Okay. Here's what happens. It's like, all right, we got to go to a wedding. And this is like in the future. And then he's like, but that's where the real story takes place. How do we get to this wedding? Flashback. I'm a working guy. I transfer meat. Lo and behold, you learn I was in the war. Hey, what's wrong with your car? I don't know what's wrong with my car. I don't know anything about cars. Well, I'm a short guy that needs to stand up here, but I think you just need to turn this. Try it now. My car works. Great. What's your name? Bye. And then later, he's shipping meat, and he makes a deal with another guy who turns out to be mafia, and he's doing all these shady meat things because he's making extra money and he's good at it. Mm-hmm. Lo and behold, he comes into a bar and runs into that, that car guy. And he's like, hey, what's up? How's it going? I ran into you again. And then and then he's all like, hey, you're really good at this, this shady business stuff. You can really hold your own. Thanks. And let's just be best friends. 
well, I have other intentions. And as they're being best friends, he's, he's starting to give me a little more jobs here and there. And after a while, he's like, hey, we have a friend who's kind of crazy. And we need someone to stand at his side to keep him from being crazy, but also to keep other people from killing him because of how crazy he is. I can do that. Here, here's a phone. I heard you paint houses. Yes, I do. I do my own carpentry, too. That's great. That's great. Well, <laughs> you sound like a nice guy. You don't know how good of a friend you have. No, I don't. La, 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 la. And then, uh, and then, and then, then, uh, then it's sad. And then, then I have to kill my friend. And then, and then we go to the wedding. And then that's what happened. My daughter hates me. And I fear my life for the rest of my life, even though there's no one alive anymore. The end. Yeah. Uh, there's a few hours <laughs> missing in there, but that's uh, that's basically the... That one's hard to recap, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically what's going on is we have we have Frank. He's, like you said, he's a, he's a meat driver. He delivers yeah. meat in a truck. And so he's really big into this this union of truck drivers, which becomes really big because that's also what Jimmy Hoffa is. He's a union guy and that's, that's what they're running for election for this whole time. But in the process, like you said, he gets involved in the mafia because of his ties with them and his experience in the military. He becomes a, a murderer. He's an basically. asset because he's really good at following orders and yeah. he's taken life before. Yeah. And so he, he becomes a hitman essentially. And he gets really, really good at it. That was one of the things that I thought was really cool is the book is titled I Heard You Paint Houses. And that's a line from the the thing because that's the first thing that Jimmy Hoffa ever says to Frank. It's I Heard You Paint Houses, which is mafia code for killing, killing people, people. Because when you shoot someone, the blood splatter is like painting like the house. Paint, yep. And then he says, I do. And I also do my own carpentry. That line is supposed to say... Yeah, I do, but I also get rid of the body. I clean up after myself, yeah. Because yeah. usually they'll cut the carpet out of the house when you clean up. Or like a coffin, carpentry. Yeah. Not carpet, carpent tree. Yes. Either way. Either way. Cleans up. Carpentry, carpentry. Hey. It works. I've heard it both ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I kind of want to just go through a few themes and, and quotes. This one was kind of hard to do, and I took a ton of notes and it's a really interesting story but because it is kind of just what this guy says happened it, it is a little bit difficult because a lot of it is just murder yeah so. and because it is a movie that's drawn out over three and a, three and a half hours it's not like three and a half hours worth of content of themes it's like one theme is drawn out for like an hour mm -hmm. and then the next theme it's like one theme it's just really monotonous and it's it's a taxing movie yeah but it's really good yeah, so the first thing I want to bring up is when young Frank, so this is during one of the flashbacks, after Bill Buffalino, so Ray Romano's character, gets him out of court, basically. So he's the lawyer, gets him off for stealing, no punishment. It was great. He introduces him, takes him out to dinner, he introduces him to his cousin, who's Russell Buffalino, Joe Pesci. And this is where they formally meet after the whole car scene that you just said, where yeah. he came to help him. And this is where things start to escalate. And so they're kind of chatting. Like you said, they're talking about the war. And Frank says this. It's crazy, but I never understood how they just kept digging their own graves. You know, maybe they thought if they did a good job, the guy with the gun would change his mind. And so he's talking about this time when he was in the military in Italy. And that's kind of how it starts there. He's talking in Italian. And that's where he served during World War II in Italy. And so they start talking about that. And he talks about how he often had to lead soldiers into the woods to execute them, force them to dig their own grave, and then pull the trigger, job's done. And so that's where Joe Pesci's character learned that Frank had kind of become used to killing. And that's where it kind of starts. But I want to talk about that quote a little bit. It's crazy, but I never understood how they could just keep digging their own graves. Maybe if they thought they did a good job, the guy with the gun would change his mind. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit in our spiritual lives. So I don't know if, if you have anything to go with that before I jump in. No, you can go ahead because I'm trying to figure out who's who in that situation. Yeah, so when I was thinking about this, I think we're the ones digging the graves, to be honest. Well, I, I was more thinking who's the guy with the gun or is there a guy with the gun? 
the way that I am understanding it, the guy with the gun is not a literal guy. Okay. It's more of sin, temptation, Satan, I guess, if you yeah. want to personify it. But yeah, it's crazy. I never understood how they could just keep digging their graves. My understanding of, of this in a, a spiritual sense is a lot of the times we think things are going get, to get better just because we're doing something completely irrelevant really well. So, well, maybe we have, we just got back from Christmas, so let's use this. We have an eating problem, right? Well, maybe that's going to get better. Like, I'm not going to have to worry about that if I'm really good at something, school, I don't know. Or maybe my temptation is, I feel like we always use this, but like a sexual temptation, right? Maybe that's going to go away if I get really good at uh, serving the Lord in some other way. Maybe if I pray really, really hard, everything will just go away. And that's not me saying like, don't pray to help with temptation because like obviously we should, but I think a lot of the times we just think that if we do something really, really well, things that we do bad are just going to disappear. Okay. So yeah, came to mind and this is the examples you use is exactly it is when with whatever is holding the gun. So whatever that sin or temptation or issue is when we ignore it. And so like ignorance is not just like shutting the door and ignoring and hoping it goes away. Sometimes ignoring it is like what exactly what you said. Like I'm not going to face this issue head on or I'm not going to like talk to someone or lean in on Christ with this. Instead, I'm just going to go and pray more or I'm going to maybe I'll say the rosary uh, more frequently, which like you said, is not bad. Prayer is great. And that's great, especially if you're using that intention towards it. But it's still also being aware of like, this is a temptation of mine. This is a sin. And I need to be aware of that. And I think I mentioned it a few episodes ago, we were talking about like setting boundaries. It's 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 when you ignore the problem altogether and using using other things as, as a means to say you're facing it when you're really you're not. Yeah. But I think even in this example, I agree with you. I think in this example, when using like the, the prayer analogy, in this example, we wouldn't even be using, we wouldn't even be praying about the situation itself. We'd be praying about something else and thinking, okay, if I pray really hard and I spend a lot of time in prayer, just like praising God, like, God, you're so good. But I never tell him that I'm struggling with X. We're not going to address X. Yeah. I think this, this is a really cool quote. Cause I think when you read it in this context, it sounds like something screw tape would say. Yeah, or, or the his, or his, his yeah. predecessor. It sounds like something that the enemy says. Like it's amazing how you can get them to just keep digging their own graves. Like they think the issue is going to go away. Yeah, and it's true. It's totally true. So the next quote that I kind of wanted to dive into, and this is Russell, and he, this is kind of just him talking in general. I don't think it was to anyone specifically. He said, "When I ask somebody to take care of something for me, I expect them to take care of it themselves. I don't need two roads coming back to me." What are your thoughts? Ooh, I mean, you're putting me on the spot for like the first time in a while. Yeah. Okay, let me think about this. When I ask, okay, so... Let me to read it again? No, when I ask someone to do something, I expect them to do it themselves. I don't, I don't, have, I don't need two roads coming back to me. So, so, tell me if you did it this way. Are you doing it this way where it's like when God asks us to do something? I didn't have a plan for this one. Great. So I one, just wanted to see what would happen. One way is like, always and every day God is calling us into something Mm -hmm. you know vocationally just daily actually we went confession earlier today yeah and I imagine your penance is probably the same but like he asked us like what or God was calling our sacrifice to be yeah and that's something too it's just daily like okay this is what I want you to do today so I want you to give up and when God gives that to us that's for us to do not like I don't know that's, no, I, I get what you're saying. So I don't know how else to get, how 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 we could like split split what we're supposed to do with someone else, but yeah, yeah. So essentially, in this context, he's saying I want as few people as possible to know about what's going on. That's that's the mafia right. thing. Like he's yes, trying to keep exactly. as few paths. Which in that sense, we do see, and I think throughout this movie, we do see a lot of loyalty, and we learn about like who do you really trust, and it does come down to this this mafia thing of family a lot, which is obviously I want to, I want to get into that or eventually at some point, unless we're doing it now. I mean, it, it fits. Let's go ahead. Well, I have something else on this quote though, but okay. Yeah. So I was just going to say like, we have all these different things of, of family, of loyalty, all these things kind of coming together. I do think what you're saying has a lot of merit too. 
where like when God calls us to something, whatever, if it's a sacrifice, if it's the vocation that we're called to, it's our calling. And it's not for us to push off on someone else. Like it's our calling and we need to fulfill it. And if we don't, it's not going to get done. But you had something else to add? Yeah. Something that came to mind was this quote actually sheds light on, you know, the power of light and darkness. Just this idea that when more people are involved in something, how much harder it is to hide it. Literally what you said, like, like it is one more people involved. And Mm -hmm. this could be one of the avenues is like the scandals in the church. Another avenue is like, we were just talking about the quote previously, our own spiritual lives. When we're dealing with something like, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to want to involve someone with that, but the more you do, then the harder it is for to you to go to walk into a room and then someone step you aside and be like, Hey, how's that thing? that you told me about that one time. And then like, you have to face the fact that like, you have to tell them it's still struggling. It's a blessing and a curse that the more people that know about something is, is bad and good. But it's, it's also like a really good thing with this idea of like us, our bodies being the light of Christ and that light spreads the more people are involved in that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like Exodus 90 that we're doing right now. Yeah. I mean, the whole point of Exodus 90, well, other than the asceticism is like fraternity. And you're supposed to have these guys that are going to help keep you accountable. Right. And a big part of that is you have to be vulnerable with those guys so they know what to keep you accountable for. Right. And within the whole fraternity, you choose an anchor, right? And that's like your partner, I guess, the person that you confide in. And with that, you need to reveal to this person, like I said, what to keep you accountable for. And you said it's kind of like there's good and bad to it. I think... The bad parts of it, though, assuming the person's not just a complete jerk, the only bad parts to it are things that are, in the end, good. In in that, like, if you have a wound, you have to clean it first. And that cleaning it sucks. Right. Right? Or, I don't know if you've ever been, like, had something stuck in your skin or, like, stepped on something that was really sharp, like a tack or something. Yeah. Like, pulling it out or ripping the Band-Aid off, whatever it is. You know, there's always, like, that's something where... For a split second, it's going to hurt, but in the end, it's going to be good, right? Because you have to clean it before it can heal. Right. And this is actually a great segue back into the family thing. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, when he's talking, when he as a mafia boss or whatever is saying it, he's saying like, let's keep it within the family and like not spread this. But really in our spiritual lives, the more people are involved in this, like the more everyone becomes like familial. Mm. Like, the family uh, isn't, like, a circle. The family is a shared wealth yeah, of an yeah. idea. And so that's what I really want to talk about with this movie is the idea of what family really means to the false idea of family as in being in the mafia. And I don't want to downplay, like, the war, but what's really important is that he came from the war. Yeah. This was someone who was, like, told how to take orders and execute them. And you see that in the beginning when he's, like, pushing meat to the very end when he doesn't want his door closed. And you can tell, there's another thing we can talk about separate from family, he never rests his entire life. Like, he never has peace. Yeah. And it's so heartbreaking. Yeah. Beautiful, what Scorsese was able to do, like, picture that, but it's heartbreaking that he never has peace. Right. And you see that in his family life throughout the movie, too. And you mentioned this in your, like, 30-second summary at the beginning, but, like, he has some really, really tough relationships with his daughters because of everything that's going on here. And you see that toll that it takes on him. And based off what you just said, I have like three different directions I want yeah, to go with this. Fine. But you, d- you did mention the army again. So I wanted to go into this next quote before we jump okay. all, all the way to the end. Because <laughs> okay. something you just said there, I just like wanted to go to the very last part. But we'll, we'll keep it together. So this part is coming from Frank. And he's kind of just summarizing his work is, for, I, for Russell. Yeah. Okay, wait, never mind. Is this the one that you wanted? I don't know. Is okay. this about being afraid? No. Okay, that's a good one too. All right, I don't know if I wrote that one down. So so this one, it says, it's kind of like the army. You follow orders, you did the right thing, you got rewarded. And when I worked for Russell, it was never for the money. And now I want to point out when he says you did the right thing, it's not like the morally right thing. It's like you did what you were supposed to correctly, like as was expected. Right. That's what he meant as right thing. Yeah, and you see where he struggles with that idea in the end. Yeah. With the priest. Yeah, which is another thing that I like, and we can kind of just throw this in here. He goes to confession at the end. He's a, he's he's an Irishman, yeah. so we have 
he's Irish. We have the mafia. Obviously, they're Catholic Italian. So, like, they go to church. They go to, like, the sacraments yeah, and stuff like that. Multiple baptisms, like you mentioned multiple earlier. Multiple baptisms. Yeah. There's confession at the end. Like Last rites. We have or... all of this stuff going on while on the other side they're pretending to be good practicing Catholics. Maybe yeah. that's something we can address really quick, too. Yeah, like the dualist. Well, okay, so he, with with this, what we're, we haven't even said it, but with the idea of being good practicing Catholics, because that that's a common trope with, like, the Godfather, like, the Mafia. They go to church. Yeah. Because they're raised that way. and But then they serve their family. And there's this scripture, right? You can't serve two masters. Yes. Because... If you serve two masters, you'll end up loving the one and despising the other, or loving the other, despising the other. Yeah. Yeah. So you're yeah. Right. And I think, and this is what's really important. The one quote I was going to mention is when they're talking about the war, he's like, How was it? Like, were you afraid? And he's like, Oh, of course I was afraid. If anyone tells you they're not afraid in war, they're like BSing you. Everyone's always afraid. And when you apply that to the rest of his life in the mafia, same rule applies. Yeah. No one, everyone is lying to you. If they're lying, you're not afraid. So I think that actually. Uh, master they despise is actually the mafia Mm. they would never say it because that's where they have power which is something that's kind of evil power is power not in itself but well their own personal power personal gain and all these things and 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 protection and family this false idea of family but they keep going to church because that's a master they do love serving Mm. that's a master where they where they do have this real sense of family like their grandmas and, and, and the everybody else who really isn't in the mafia but is kind of aware of what's going on can still be like, at least you're going to church. You know, God loves you. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of where I was thinking about this, where I think it's really, really common for us to have this these dual lives mm-hmm. where we're Catholic for an hour on Sunday, maybe a few other places in there. But for the rest of my life, we need the church to stay out of my business and just keep it on Sunday. Let me do my own thing. I think we're we're all guilty to that to a certain extent. I mean, that's what sin is essentially. But I I think that's so, so common now. And I don't know, I don't know like what caused it necessarily. Maybe it's this idea of like separation of church and state, but now it's separation of church from everything, you know, or maybe it's a a mistrust of the church. I, I really don't know like what started it, but we see this idea. And actually I was talking about this today. So if you're familiar with like Eastern religion, so like like Hinduism or Buddhism or Shintoism, like all of those. Confucianism. Confucianism. Taoism. Yeah, yeah Taoism. So uh, this is a perfect example, actually. So we look at China. And so I used to study a little bit of East Asia in college. That was one of my degrees that I, I was working on. And one of the things we learned in my studies is about how China had like three not technically official religions, but basically official religions, right? So they had Buddhism, they had Confucianism, and they had Taoism. And most of the people in China were not one of those. They were all of those because Eastern religions a lot of the times are not mutually exclusive. And so Buddhism is the way that you ritually worshipped. Mm-hmm. Confucianism was like your your practical way of life, your civility, your nationalism in a way. And then you have Taoism, which is your spiritual way of life. So more of a personal thing. And so all three of them kind of overlapped in a way, and none of them were mutually exclusive. Whereas Western religions are extremely uh, exclusive. Like, for example, Christianity. We claim that there is one God. All those religions that we just discussed claim that there are hundreds, if not thousands of gods. There can't be both, right? There's either one or there's many. And so they're exclusive from one another. And something happened, and, and maybe it's maybe it, part of it is like this uh, movement in like the 60s and 70s towards Eastern spirituality. But we now have this idea that we can be both Catholic and Buddhist, or we can be both Christian and Hindu. That That's a thing. And even if it's not explicit, we think that we can be both Catholic and atheist in a way in the way that we live our life or agnostic even i I don't know does that does that make sense what i'm saying No, that makes perfect sense yeah yeah and i don't know really what caused that i think there's a lot of contributing factors but i think it's a really real problem been boiled down to i mean it's rare someone says i am catholic and this but it's boiled down to is the word spiritual 
Like, yeah. I'm a spiritual person or like, I'm not sure if I believe in a God or, or what that is. I can't really define that, but, but I'm spiritual. I love like these things. And another perfect example of this dual life is Daredevil in the sense of he's yeah. pretty much Batman, except his Jim Gordon is like a nun and a priest. Like yeah. He lives at the church and then he goes off and he's a vigilante at night. And it's a little harder than it is with the mafia when you think about that, because he's getting bad guys. Right. But. But, you know, so that's like, it's not the same as like the mafia, but it is also still not right. It's still dual life. But the interesting thing, like I said, with the mafia, with this idea of I'm spiritual, but I'm not. And then with this idea of this, they they all boil down to this natural desire for Christ. For worship. And for worship. Yeah. And for this familial mystical body of Christ. Yeah. Like, in the end of the day, Daredevil comes back to the church yeah. For, because he needs repentance, he needs these things. And in the end of the day, the mafia are on church on Sundays. And in the end of the day, people that are spiritual are spiritual because they have this innate desire. Right. Yeah. And that's where the conversation I was having today kind of went because we were talking about kind of that dual spirituality thing. And no matter what you identify as, everything leads back to a desire for worship. Even if you identify as an atheist, but you really like sports, people worship sports. Mm-hmm. Like literally, it, yeah. By definition, like you worship, like down here in Texas, football is absolutely worshipped. And I mean, going to a football game with fifty thousand people, it's kind of like going to your own little NFL worship party. You know, you have your own chants, you have your own rituals, you come together for pre gaming, and you do the same thing every time. Like you are a ritualistic, uh, not like formal religion, but kind of like you're making your own religion in a way. I'm not saying you can't go to football games. Don't misread that. But we have this natural desire as humans to worship. And I think the next question then is how do we get back to understanding what it means to be Catholic? Because maybe that's why we feel like we're falling into this dualistic nature where we don't know what it means to be Catholic anymore. Like how how do we even address that? I think bringing you back to the movie because this movie paints the best part Houses. about this movie, it does paint, but this movie, the best part of this movie is that it follows Frank. Like it follows his story. He's the one telling the story. Yeah. That, it's, that's one of the biggest loopholes because it is a perspective piece, but it's also beautiful because you're journeying along, figuring out like little breadcrumbs along the way very slowly, but then you notice like things. And so like we just mentioned, he's doing, as he said, I'm doing the right thing. The right thing is orders. He's answering orders. He's doing the right thing to what he's told. But it's also the right thing to him because it's providing for his family. Mm -hmm. This right thing is keeping his girls safe. It's keeping his wife safe. It's putting money on the table. But it's not the right thing. And we see this near at the end of the movie when he's in confession. And essentially, I think we've kind of already spoiled a little bit. But spoilers, essentially, the idea is that he was the one give. Oh, yeah, you said he was the one that ended up taking Hoffa's life. Yeah. And he, he you knows... You can look in the news, like, this isn't a huge spoiler. He knows a day in advance. Like, he's the one that's supposed to be getting off at, like, the next day in the morning. They're going to fly out. He's doing it. And he's told, don't call him. Don't call him. Because they were friends. Like, Hoffa gave him everything. They were best friends, yeah. And he can't sleep that night. He's staring at the phone. He, he wants to do something. But he knows the right thing, quote, unquote. The right thing, not morally, but from what is, he's told to kill Hoffa and not call him because if he did he's dead his family's dead you know everything but also he loses his family quote unquote again with Russell who is also his best friend like he raised him yeah manipulatively but he raised him gosh okay can can we jump into this next part then because i think that ties right into what you're you're talking about here so i want to skip kind of some of the sure, mi- middle yeah, stuff yeah that's fine so just to skip to where we get after he starts working for Hoff, Hoffa, things escalate. A lot of things go down, but we're going to skip most of that. You can go watch the movie. We're going to dive into later on. This is, I think, a year or two before the the main timeline, like when things actually go down. Frank gets an award, or he's about to get an award. So yeah. there's this big yeah, ceremony. Yeah, this is the switch. This is the shift. This is where a lot of stuff goes down. And so I really want to talk about And this. really quickly, so if you're not paying attention, you miss it. Right. So if there's anything that I miss, feel free to to jump in. But one of the big things is Frank asked Jimmy to present the award to him at the dinner. And everyone is there. And right now, Jimmy Hoffa is in 
Like, oh, he's got he's in sixty targets or more on big him. big trouble because he publicly spoke out against one of the guys who was running in the election against him because he was supported by the mafia, and the mafia had been supporting him in the past as well. And so now he's like, "Are, are you not like grateful for what we've done for you?" And so Russell comes up to him at at this dinner, and Russell is trying to protect Jimmy out of love for Frank, and so he says this. Some people think that you're demonstrating a lack of appreciation. And he later on says, after Jimmy is just like denying him, denying him, he says, I'm trying to help you, Jimmy. And Jimmy Hoffa, before he walks away, says, I know that. But nobody threatens Hoffa. And he walks nobody away. Nobody threatens Hoffa. Yeah. I know that. And so this idea that like, dude, the mafia is coming after you. Like they literally just told you, like, you're in big trouble. He's trying to help you. And he's like, Nobody threatens off. And this this pride, like this idea that nobody can touch me, and what happens a year later, they they off him. Like he's gone. Right? And so this idea of going back to not addressing the issue and having like this pride that's saying, I don't need to address that. I can handle this my own way. He says this over and over again. This is my union. No one's gonna take that from me. I'll do whatever I have to. Like you're focusing on the union. You think if you do really, really good at whatever your your union job is, then this problem with the mafia will just disappear. It's just like the grave digging. You think if you do a good job at digging, it's going to disappear. And that's, yeah, that's exactly it. It's literally the reason he felt like he was untouchable is because for years he was untouchable, but because he had the mafia behind him. Right. And it's this idea that that is in screw tape letters. It's this idea of how the enemy works. The enemy is going to shape you the same way. Ru- Russell is really a great depiction of the enemy because he's the one slowly walking with Frank and shaping him and and growing to who Frank is in the end of the movie. And what I wanted to talk about with that idea was that when he's confessing, the priest is like, "Do you feel? What do you do? You feel anything?" And he was like, "No." And he's like, "Do you feel remorse for anything?" And he's like, "It's all like water under the bridge." And he's like. Okay, well, just so you know, like some people don't have to feel sorry to be sorry. And he was like, he was like, I get it. And then he started sp- like sputtering something that the priest didn't understand. He was like, what kind of guy would I be if I made that phone call? What kind of guy makes that phone call? And he's talking about calling Hoffa. Yeah. And in that moment, he does feel guilty, but he knows that the guy that would do the right thing wouldn't have made that phone call. And he can't actually repent and it's it's just this issue that his brain has been rewired through doing the right thing. Yeah, he doesn't the understand the distinction over, he between does not. between the word right. Just like Hoffa doesn't understand the distinction between nobody threatening him, and that can happen to our spiritual lives. When we do something wrong over and over and over again, we can't figure out the distinction, and yeah. we're stuck. And so yeah. that's I think that's the answer to the dualist idea is like we have to go back and find the the root i think father mike had that homily series a long time of like digging up the roots yeah and you can't just like keep cutting the weeds you have to like go down and figure out what the sure. root issue is let's dive into this next part because okay. I, I think this ties back to so right after this conversation we flash to the same dinner but russell is sitting down with frank at this point and you hinted at this before i think this is huge it's great Russell gives Frank a copy of his ring that only he and one of the other mob bosses, Angelo, has. And it's this huge gift. And in doing so, he tells Frank that Frank is his son. And Russell was never able to have kids. And so this is him adopting Frank. And so your analogy of of him as Satan, it, it makes sense. Because it's, it's over time, over these decades of, okay, working on, working on, okay, now you're mine. Your mind. Well, this... Okay, go ahead. I was going to say the very next thing that happens. Or Do you have something to add? The next conversation? No, I'm, I was just going to say, this... Getting the ring literally is the build-up to asking him to kill Frank Hoffa. Yes. I mean, not Frank Hoffa, but Jimmy, Jimmy Hoffa. Hoffa. This is literally... Because what he does is, Hoffa's in trouble. You're his right-hand man. They're going to want to take you both down. I'm going to give you this ring so no one touches you. Because he says that. He's like, you don't know... No one's going to touch you now. And so that's their signal of like, I can't, touch ha- I can't touch Frank. But it's also a way to say, Frank, you're my son. Like you don't know, like even early in the movie, you don't know how good of a friend you have. Like they keep getting this idea of like, mm-hmm. you owe everything to him. Yeah. It's and so manipulation. When, and so when he finally asks, he, there's so much that he feels like he owes him. 
given the protection that he does it. And he tells Frank in that conversation that he needs to go talk to Jimmy like right away and tell him he needs to cut it out. He needs to reconcile with the mafia. This is his last chance. He says the higher ups have said it is what it is. In other words, that's code for at this point, either you cut it out now or even if you do cut it out, you might still be screwed at this point. And that's more likely what happened. And so Frank says it's a fairy tale. He's never going to back down. Like Jimmy's never going to back off of this. And so he goes to Jimmy. They have this conversation. It's the same thing over and over again. I'm not going to do it. Frank tells Jimmy to get protection. Hoffa says that he's not going to get protection. They'll just go for his family or they'll go for Frank. And he says, you're with me, so they'll go for you too. Right? That was the point of the ring. That's the point of the ring. And Especially because so, he just said he supported Frank Hoffa publicly. I mean, I keep saying Jimmy Frank Hoffa. He said, yeah, I just said when he received the award, like, I back Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. Which was not good. Right. And so we have the ring is exchanged. Now he's the son of Russell. Then we have this conversation where Jimmy's like, you're with me, right? And then flash forward to the breakfast you were talking about where Russell tells Frank about how he has to murder Jimmy the next that, that afternoon. And what he says is, you're with me, right? I can protect you because you're with me. And so we see this coming up. Like, who is he really with, right? And we see both sides are trying to manipulate him. And so it's this idea of, like you're talking about, the family. He's become a son, like an adopted son in a way, of what we're dubbing kind of this this Satan figure. Although I, I will say Russell does have like some, does. some no, good I'm qualities not, yeah. in there. He's not like perfect Satan figure. But sometimes those good qualities can just hide something worse that's being built up to which I don't think was Russell's intention. But in this character, the way that it's building up, that's what it comes it's, off I think as. it's simply because he works for the mafia that it can come across that way. And it's, and it's simply boiled down to that they're both manipulating him, but Russell did a better job because Jimmy, there was a one scene where he's yelling at everyone in his office because something happened and Frank walks out and he's like, I can't, I'm not taking this. You can't yell at me like that. Like, I wasn't yelling at you. I was yelling at everyone I was yelling, else. But, but like, that's how Jimmy was. He probably was kind of mad at everyone. He was just mad. Yeah. Whereas if Russell was mad at something that, no, if Russell was mad at something that Frank did, oh, yeah. what he actually did was he went to his boss who would have hurt Frank and said, he's a kid, he's learning, like, he's good. Keep, let him let him keep doing this. He's, he's, he, it was a mistake. Yeah. And that's when he's like, you don't know how good of a friend you have because you just like lost us a lot of freaking money. Right. And that's how you win someone over. And But that's the way the enemy works they're not right. going to be yelling at you they're going to be slowly thinking that you're your friend yeah and then the very last line of this conversation is from jimmy he says in the end there's only one thing that's real this is my union this is my union frank it's really simple when you see it that way and he keeps saying this throughout the movie especially in this latter half and he's saying like this is mine and that's what's real nothing else matters nothing else is real and He's so he's so focused on this. It's, it's that one track mind of like, if I do this well, it keeps tying back to that, that if I do this well, everything else will sort itself out. Nothing else matters. Nothing else is real. And completely neglecting the fact that there's an entire mob of Italians trying to... Well, that's the irony. It's like, this is his union, and it is, but he is theirs. Yeah, but at this point, it's not even his union anymore. He lost that too. Yeah. For now. Yeah, and then the next thing we see is, is what you had been talking about before, where we flash forward, now we're in the future, and we start building up to the murder itself. If, if this is something you're interested in, if you like murder mysteries and stuff like that, this is a real murder mystery that still has not technically been solved. Frank ended up coming clean many years later to the, the guy that wrote the book, Charles Brandt, but technically that hasn't been proven. He was already suspected for this kind of thing, and so that's kind of the most accepted... Uh, answer to what happened but it, it's not officially proven so do some digging it, it is pretty interesting if you want to check out the the podcast where they discuss all of this stuff check out jimmy akin's mysterious world uh the disappearance of jimmy hoffa and we'll put that in the the notes probably too so but yeah so the rest of the movie is just the the killing so we'll skip over that you can figure that out for yourself and then it flashes forward until frank is older and it talks about how everyone else is arrested and for other things, not for the murder. 
and then they end up getting old or getting sick or getting murdered. And pretty soon, Frank is the only one that's left and he's sitting alone. He's trying to reconcile with his family, but he can't. There's a conversation I wanted to go in with one of his daughters, but for the sake of time, we're gonna have to skip over that. But essentially, it's the whole, like, I did this to protect you. And the daughter's like, you have no idea what you put us through. And we were afraid of you. We were afraid of your friends. We couldn't talk to you because if we brought something to you, and you see this in the movie, he literally goes and breaks a guy's hand because his daughter knocked something over in the guy's shop. And so he like hit her and sent her out of the shop. And so Frank comes in and breaks his hand and like beats the heck out of him. And so they're like, we can't talk to you about our problems because if, if we do, you might kill that person. Right. And so they're just like, you have no idea what you put us through. And so we see what, that, what all these these things have to do with the consequences that, that they have on his real family and that he's sacrificed his real family. And another thing I didn't mention, he got divorced in there too. So he actually has his, I guess, two families in there. He's had two wives and four daughters, I think. Yeah. And so we see what happens to them with all this going on. And he's trying to hide all this. And they know that he's involved in this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Like, she knew at a young age. She was super aware. Right. The one oldest daughter. But he never admitted to Jimmy and what he did there. And they were really close to Jimmy. And so that that really affected them. So Yeah, the, what, going off that real quick, that the last thing really was that I wanted to talk about was them getting older. Same kind of idea of him, like, losing everything in his family. This really hilarious idea of them being in this mafia because it provides power and family and protection and all these things that they were gaining... In the end, you're seeing them, like, one guy they talk about literally is, like, he just poops himself because he can't hold his bowels in. Yeah. And then Russell has a stroke, and they're just, like, shaking and just, like, barely playing bocce ball in prison. And, like, in the end, they have nothing. Power's gone. The money's gone. In the end, they gained nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just this irony of, like, what you focus on in life, what do you get in the end? What's your reward? Yeah. There's two more things I want to hit on okay, really great. quickly. Yeah, so do it. this is one after he realizes like his family doesn't want to talk to him and they literally will not speak to him anymore. He goes and he buys a casket and a place to be buried. And this is what he says. Uh, it's kind of like a, a monologue over the scene. So he says, sooner or later, everyone put here has a date of when they're going to go. That's just the way it is. I think there's got to be something when you go because how the hell did this whole thing start? People smarter than me can't figure it out. That's why I would never go for cremation. It's so final. That's the hardest part of when they bury you. It's so final. You go into a building. The building is there. The crypt is there. They have you in a, a metal casket. And they have you you in a room. They have that there. It's just not, not as final. You're dead, but it's not as final. And so he has this like obsession with death being so final but he admits like he believes there's got to be something there's got to be some kind of god and that that goes back to like the spirituality that we talked about before he clearly recognizes like there's something but he's like obsessed with this finality of things and i think that's interesting because he spent the last 50 years of his life doing this to people and not even thinking about it until he starts going to confession he starts having these conversations he's like oh yeah like this is this is real and that kind of leads into this last point that I want to make. And so the way that this movie portrays his coming forth with this information is the FBI comes up to him and is like, everyone else is dead. You have no one else to protect. Just please tell us. So the FBI comes. He refuses to say anything. He tells them, go speak to my attorney because that's what they were trained to do. Go tell, talk to my attorney. They tell him that the attorney is dead. Everyone is dead. But Hoffa's family isn't. They are here. And they got to live not knowing. That's hard to do. You've got kids, Frank. Can you imagine? Frank, it's time. It's time you say what happened. This line was really interesting for me. I think it shows how liberating the truth can be. Not only for the family who needs to hear, even though they know something happened and they can, they can guess. But it's also liberating for Frank. Yeah. Who he's been going to confession He's been praying with this priest every day. They've been talking together and he still seems paranoid, even though, like you said, he doesn't feel remorse. Something's bothering him, you know, and, and he goes and he talks about finality. Father Mike just had a, a podcast about this back in, in November or December. The reason why it's so hard for us to say goodbye 
is because we, yeah, yeah, we yeah. never actually do what we need to do while we're here. Yeah. And I think that's what's happening here is like the reason why he's so paranoid about finality is because he doesn't feel like he's done what he needs to here because he spent his entire time killing people and he never actually spent the time with his family and doing what he needed to do. And so with that, do we have a challenge? Oh boy. Uh, stay at school. <laughs> Let's start with just th- that last thought there. Rather than waiting until it's too late, start taking the moments that you live in and spending them well. And so the example Father Mike used was in the Midwest, there's like nine steps to saying goodbye. And this is so real. Like I actually lived them while I was back for Christmas and everywhere you go, those steps. But the reason why it's so hard to do that, that long goodbye is because we don't actually live those moments with those people well. And so stop having fake conversations. That's my challenge for you this week. Have real conversations with people. Ask them serious questions. You don't have to just like go right into like, how do you want to be buried? You've talked about that before, but like if there's someone that you're really close with, go for it. Or maybe even ask, there's someone who asked this question a lot and it it was really powerful for me. What brings you joy? Instead of saying like, hey, how you doing? And they're like, oh, good, good, good. Staying busy. You know, like that's the cliche answer. Ask, what brings you joy? What makes you happy? Something like that. And just make make people think and and actually have real conversations and, and see what happens this week. Yeah, I would say... Another fun challenge, maybe not fun, but another cool thing. It's a little different than previous ones would be take a piece of paper, make a list of passions in your life, things that you're like, this is what I want people to know about me. And, you know, kind of hopefully, ideally, like, well, where you put down, like, Catholic, that like, I am Catholic, or where they put down that, like, I believe in God or something like that. Somewhere I, I would hope religion kind of falls in there or your faith life. But then the other things, too, like for me, it would be art. And, and movies and music and stuff like that. And then order them in the sense of where their importance falls from top to bottom based on you. And then write it, make another list of where you think someone else that knows you, not very well, but just like someone else that kind of knows you service level, where they would rank those things just look viewing you. Mm. And see if, it, see if you kind of put them in the same place. And this is that idea of the, the, the two masters. You know, it's not wrong to have hobbies, not wrong to have other passions, but are you putting God first? Right. Are you putting people first, like you were just saying? And that idea of like, or are you putting all these things, are you putting all these things that are giving you great things now, but in the end, you're just going to be really old in a wheelchair, shakingly throwing a bocce ball down a court? Yeah. Essentially, that's a way of like asking yourself the question, like, who do you really serve? Right. Shout outs. Oh, buddy. Um, I would like to shout out. Kevin Madler, he helped me move in here two days, three days in a row. Uh, I would like to shout out Lauren Koth. She is was a missionary with yeah. the door. Now she's she just moved up to Pittsburgh, missionary with Vagabond. Vagabond Missions. She gave me all the furniture I own. It's beautiful furniture, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's great. It's great. If you become a patron, you can see it. Uh, <laughs> shout Slide that in there. out just. I don't know. I, we've been, I feel like we've been like really like taking a towel and wringing out this wedding thing, but it's finally happening, so we'll be done talking about it, hopefully. Just everyone involved, my parents, Lizzie's parents, all those things, as well as just different people who listen to this podcast and just give us great feedback. I know there's, there's people all over Canada. I know where you're from. A lot of your friends are just acquaintances. That South like, Canada. Actually, Midwest. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that check out this podcast. Just you guys, too. Yeah. Any shout outs? Yeah, so when this episode comes out, I will actually be on retreat with all of my confirmation students. So we are taking 110 students uh, on a weekend retreat. So please pray for us. Shout out to all of them. Shout out to the chaperones who are taking their weekend to do whatever I tell them, basically, uh, and spend time with these kids. And yeah, it's going to be great. It always rains literally every year because that's what happens in January because it's uh, too hot down here to snow. So pray for us that no one gets sick, everyone stays safe, and that the retreat goes well. Yep. With that, thank you guys for joining us this week on the adventure. Don't forget to subscribe on whatever you're listening to. Follow us. Share us with people. Please leave a review if you can. It only takes a couple seconds. Whatever platform you're listening to, we really appreciate it. Don't forget, 
we are going to be fasting from media. So if you want us to do something, you need to let us know and we can break our fast for those things. So please help us out. We would really, really appreciate that. If you do want to have extra content, we have been doing uh, extra long episodes. We have video, stuff like that. If you want to be involved in that kind of stuff, please become a patron on patreon.com backslash the Christian culture. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at on the adventure Two on Facebook at The Christian Culture, and of course on YouTube, The Christian Culture. Thank you guys for joining us in the adventure. We'll see you next week. Adios. It's keep, cool. We can keep we, it running. We can keep it running. Yeah. And then we didn't pray either. So. Yeah, that's fine. Let's do that first. I can edit that out. Yeah. Or we don't edit it out. We can rearrange it. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Great. I'll start. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit. Teach us to pray. Uh, Lord, forgive us for being so forgetful. We are the worst sometimes, but you are so good. Thank you for allowing us to do this ministry and to spread your news in whatever way we can help this conversation to be fruitful. We ask that you send your spirit down upon all those that hear this show, help them to receive you and know you in a new way. We also ask that you send your spirit down upon Gordon and Lizzie as they prepare for their marriage and the next step in their vocation. Lord, be with all of us, guide us, and teach us to love. We ask in your name. Amen. Well, we have our blooper. We have our intro.